So in 2010, you started Coherent, which was the same name that you had back with with the Victor Feldman. Yeah, we called it Coherent Sound back then. And then I changed it. Um, my partner, Bob Vanderveen and I, we started and we came up together with the name Coherent with the intentional misspelling. And so he's Coherent Electronics. And I became, after Coherent Sound, I became Coherent Audio and Video because I was building large loudspeaker systems and most of them were going into video rooms. So it kind of made sense to call it Coherent Audio and so Video. So is that person still living? Yeah, Bob Vanderveen, yeah. Does he still do this? He still does electronics, yeah. Yeah. So, so okay, so you got... Uh, you built out your awesome studio. Right. And studio. and I had a name change again. It became Coherent Audio LLC at that point. Okay. So, all right. So you've been doing that since 2010. The end of 2011. 11 years. Yeah. All right. Uh, is there anything you want to talk about? About, uh, I know that one of the big things you're doing is the tone poet uh blue notes right i know that's uh huge and, and if you want to talk about that is great if there's anything other this is you know go ahead and talk about from from uh 2010 till now not to till now and then i'm going to bring up some of the, go through some of the things that we work to work together on Okay. Well, yeah, Tone Poet has kind of been the big thing for me since uh, we started that in, what, 2017 or 19? I can't remember. My, my life's a blur these days. But anyway, it's been going. Not yeah, I guess, that long ago. It was 2019, I guess. So it's, it's been a couple of years, two, three years. Um, and it was a concept by Joe Harley and Don was um, to basically – put out a series of records that would incorporate both the classic old blue notes and some of the much more recent blue note material by artists um, that were after the, the days of uh, Francis Wolf and, and Alfred Lyon. Um, stuff that, you know, after Liberty bought them. And, uh, and then there's some other labels that have kind of merged into the fold, like Pacific Jazz and World Pacific. Um, that's, that's now considered part of blue note. So a lot of the titles have come from there. And um, it's it's been just a blast to work on all of it. Uh, Joe and I work really well together and it's it's been very fun. So, and, yeah. Uh, you know, Don's been great too. You know, I, I was intimidated by Don was prior to meeting him because I, I, I knew his reputation and, you know, what he had done. And uh, the first time he came in and we worked together, it was just, uh, you know, after 10 minutes, I felt like I'd known him 10 years. He's just, he's a very fun guy. And a, and a walking encyclopedia of jazz. It's amazing. So, um, so yeah, that's been a big deal. Uh, it's selling so many records. Um, yeah, we've we've consistently had seven of the top ten jazz albums on Amazon's chart. You know the stuff that they sell. Well. I know y'all have done good with that, but I think kind of blue. They just call us at bi a billboard. It's some somehow charted. Cool. And uh, but you just reminded me of that. But anyway, I know that's been a big deal, y'all. If and I'm I mean, also I doing know, the, I'm also doing the classics series for Blue Note at the same time. You know, so it's 80, I, I get the titles confused. The 80th. Well, it 80th, was called the 80th. It you know in in uh, 2019 which was the 80th, but since then they changed the name to classics and it's going on. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, uh, I think it'd be better for me to, to, to be the one that talk about this. So I think, um, you know, Don was, was hired by blue note to be the president of blue note. Right. Right. And so, um, and I mean, he's like, one of the best producers in the world, one of the most famous producers in the world and musicians and, and, and is a celebrity and of course knows his stuff. But a lot of musicians, um, they know music and they know groove and they know, you know, but, and they're experts at what they're experts at, but they don't 
sometimes always know about the sound that the consumer wants to hear or the best way of obtaining what process to go right. to make right. the best records. Well, Don is very honest about that because the way the thing got initiated is he went to Joe Harley and said, hey, look, I was kind of in charge of the 75th anniversary stuff and it got totally panned by the audiophile press. So would you be interested in taking it on? And so that's how Tone Poet happened because Tone Poet is, is uh, you know, Harley's nickname that he, he got from Charles Lloyd. So. Right, right. I was going to, that's what I was going to say. And uh, sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, it's fine because I was thinking that maybe. But, but Don's real you, honest about it. You know, he doesn't. No, no, I know. But I, I mean, the reason I was going to say it is that I thought that maybe it'd be better me like you might not have wanted to, to oh. say but, but anyway it's all good and, and it's, yeah. it's just the, the truth is the truth it's how somebody's going to take it or not don oh and that's the other thing is i don't know how to master a record you know don hard somebody that he recognized that knew how to do it uh or or, or make a good product right he hired the right person for the job and uh and it was a smart thing to do. You know what I mean? And like Don knows what Don knows and Joe don't know what Don knows and Joe knows what Don don't know. And, and it's a perfect uh, partnership. Right. And um, so, so then, um, you know, of course, Blue Note's owned by Uni and, you know, we were the first ones to reissue the 50 Blue Notes um that you cut and that that's one thing we was going to talk about but now um and then music matters started soon after uh now that universal who owns blue note and owns verve and impulse they recognize the joe harley uh, uh the um the tone poet was is just such a success they came to, they approached me and they wanted me to do the same thing similar for Verve, Impulse, yeah. uh, and the other labels like Phillips and uh, Emerson, all the other jazz. Good stuff, yeah. So the Blue Note and the Pacific Jazz is under the Blue Note. Right, and Liberty. And Liberty. Blue Note, Liberty, and Pacific Jazz is Tone Poet, and the rest of Uni Jazz is under the Acoustic Sound Series. Uh -huh. So we're doing the same thing. And uh, it's funny you say on the charts, we're on the billboard charts with the Love Supreme and the Ballads, which made another label recognize that this partnership, you know, the, the major label hiring somebody that does reissues is a successful combination. Right. Another label is approaching me to do the same thing. Um so when they the success is just too too big for anybody to to not recognize uh -huh. and you know in the small label is um you know they're they're these labels are recognizing the success and the amount of records being sold so so we're doing the same thing as the tone poet. Right. And I but but now on the tone poet, they've uh picked you as their 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 mastering engineer. And on the acoustic sounds verve series, they're like, Well, who do you want to choose as your mastering guy? And I'm like, I, I don't wanna choose. I wanna be able to, depending on what what job it is choose that job if it makes sense so they go well well you know do you want to use ryan k smith on i says no we'll use ryan but i want to be able to use kevin when i think it's appropriate i want to use ryan when i think it's appropriate and i want to use bernie when i think it's appropriate and who knows you know um you know we have matt luthans who you've uh, trained and is working that we have the Doug Sachs master facility. There might be a record or two we cut. So 
so that's how I've done the acoustic sounds verb series. Like uh, Bernie Grunman, I've got parts that Bernie Grunman cut for classic on the verb uh, that are outstanding. Sure. Well, hey, if it's awesome, why go back and you know get find the tapes? And, sure, sure. You know, same and with the Ray Charles. Oil. Huh? Yeah, right. Yeah. Hey, you just did the Ray Charles. It was awesome. Why go through you know getting the master tapes and that? So you will be getting some of this acoustic sounds verb stuff um you already have uh you know brian got a lot of it but it like i said if the tapes are on the west coast or if there's a reason why i want to pick you but i want to be able to maybe you're too busy there's all kinds of reasons i wanted to keep my options open you know and That's and fine. choose the right person for the right job uh, with all things considered. Right. Um, so we've got the Acoustic Sounds Verve series. And, uh, you know, and the Tone Poet, I mean, y'all knocked it out of the park. And, I mean, it's it's proven. Uh, right. I mean, it's, it's you know, I mean, like, it's just uh, a successful thing, and we can't keep them in stock. And uh, whereas the Tone Poet is strictly using you in RTI, uh, we're strictly be pressing the acoustic sounds verb series at QRP, sure. but we're going to use different mastering engineers. Uh, so I think we, I wanted to accomplish us talking about your history. I wanted your history as well as I want Bernie's history to be documented, Doug Sachs history to be documented, Bob Ludwig, uh, you know, talk about the highlights uh, I think it's important, the history of all the audio, uh, the, even the reissue labels, the history of DCC, the history of the original Mobile Fidelity, you know, people like Stan Ricker. I want all of these things to be, people to be recognized. Um, we probably hadn't talked enough about Stan. Maybe we'll do it at another time. But I, I like these things to be uh, documented while the people are still living, mm -hmm. while they can remember, I mean, you know, we're starting to forget a lot of stuff. Um, I think it's important. And and I think now with YouTube and we have a YouTube channel and I mean, it is on fire. People are loving this stuff. They want to hear the masters talk about the behind the scenes stuff that only you and sometimes me, they, they get to see, and we need to document it before we forget, but it's a perfect way to do it because it's right. You can do it better now and easier talking about it than having to write it all down. Sure. And uh, so I think we went through your history pretty good, although you know we we swang back and forth a lot. A uh, you know, but you started early, man. I mean, you told me some things that in, in the twenty years of knowing you. Um, Let's see, from 97 to now, that's not, um, let's see, 97, three, um, not quite 20 years, but a long time. And, um, oh, yeah, no, no, it's, no, it's yeah. more than 20. It's more, more than, than that. 20. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So we, I was right. So we. Um, yeah. And, you know, it should get mentioned that the first thing I ever worked with you on was the monk box because you came out for that when I, I was up okay. at Acoustic. Or, all right. actually, I wasn't even up at Acoustic full time at that point. I was I was still working. Okay, well, all I, right. so I came in. Fun. I came in during the day to work with you on on that record. You know, I took okay, the day well, off. The I'm, hey, I'm glad because I just kind of brought these things out, not in any order. Yeah. But since since we went through the history uh yeah, I didn't. I didn't know. Even though we talked for twenty years, I didn't know about that you started when you were six. That you remembered, and I get asked this: What was the first record? I can't remember. You remembered the six. first record. Yeah. You remembered your first. You you better at remembering years. So I think you've told some stories of stuff I couldn't remember, or I didn't can I know. Tell you, can I tell you a funny story about the monk box? Okay. So so after we worked our first day on that stuff. I had to go back to Futuredist to actually master something that night. And I walked in the door and I'm talking with Chris Solom, one of the other mastering engineers there. Yeah. He looked at me kind of funny. And he goes, 
what are you on? What do you mean, what am I on? He goes, are, are you high? And I said, yeah, man, I'm high on Thelonious Monk. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I was so stoked after that day working on that stuff. Well, that's a, that's a good, that's a good. It's a true uh, story. It's no, a true it's story. a great true story. And it, so, so I did the Miles Prestige set with, with Stan at Acoustic. It was one of the first things. So there was there's the five prestige records like Miles got the contract from Columbia, but he owed fi uh, uh, prestige five records. Yeah, so he yeah, went in yeah. and cut five records, <laughs> cooking, relaxing, steaming, smoking. Great stuff. And to me, they're, you know, they they're all standards. It's just such good stuff. It's it's so I love those uh, records. Yeah, they're great. And it, it's almost great that he didn't go in and think about it. And rehearse yeah. and do yeah it, it just went and kicked out five killers so we did the great prestige box stan did it uh it was great so what's next you know we're working with uh, uh fantasy that own prestige riverside contemporary pablo uh ralph caffel and um uh, so man the the, the prestige Miles box was a success. What's next? You know, you always, well, what's, how do you follow up something like that? Okay, let's do Monk. Well, man, Monk has too many records. You know, we can't, he had some on Prestige. He had some on Riverside. So you just did the Riversides, right? Well, not just the Riverside. That would have been a huge box in itself. So oh. we came up with, we called it the River Tenor, tenor Sessions. Oh, okay. The Riverside Tenor Sessions where it's like, what what uh, saxophone player played with them? You know, like nice Johnny man. Griffin and uh, and John Coltrane. So that way we were able to make a smaller box set because box sets are a bitch, man. And box sets kill kill RTI. They kill a I mean a QRP for sure. Right. So you did the Riverside tenor session, which was a great box. We got the uh, the photo from uh, uh, William Claxton. Preston RTI, Bob Blumenthal did the liner. You mastered it. So we're going to go into the things that, uh, and I mean, we cannot go through everything you cut for me in uh, Analog Productions. But I would say that the first 10 records or so, maybe 10, maybe the first 20 records I had duck sacks cut. And then somewhere in there, you started cutting for acoustic. So of course, uh, we we uh, hired you. Um, so that, thank you for telling me that was one of the first things, and that's what some of the things I wanted to talk about. I'm gonna jump to something that you just cut, I, and this is the Charles Mingus Blues and Roots. I love that record. Yeah. I love that record. That was a huge surprise to me. And you just did it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is a kind of a I mean, two days ago. People, yeah. yeah. People like to, uh, when they watch these videos, the one thing you'll learn is they like to be told something like it's a new, nobody knows about this. It's a right. big reveal. It's sure. to come. I mean, there's so many big things that we're working on that we can't mention because they're so huge that you know, it'll break our, the, like the kind of blue, It you, you heard about crashing websites. It really crashed our website. I, I mean, literally. So they want, there's some big reveals that we crash our website, but that's a reveal I can talk about. You just cut it. And well, better crash that way than by hackers or something. <laughs> hey, that happens too, but thank God that hadn't happened yet. But uh, the, uh, Shoot, I wanted to man, it just I um Green's Clearwater. Well, yeah, I wanted to talk about some of the different things that you cut. And so you reminded me of the first thing, and you reminded me about the last thing. So um, and you've done most of the mastering for analog productions uh in between 97 and now. Um and we're going to hit some highlights. Uh, one of the things is uh, this Buddy Holly, which we had Graham Nash at our at our uh, our office, 
and he saw that we had this record. Now, here's a really interesting story on this record because you cut it for that MCA series that we didn't talk that much about, which we should have. But, you know, a, a, supposedly a lot of tapes got burned in the Unifier, and supposedly all the Buddy Holly was burned. Now, we know that's not true right? because you had the master on this before the fire and after the fire. And they also had Welling Jennings, the Jolie Blanc, which is a Cajun song that was on the tape, which I was like, man, we got to, I was thinking about how we should cut that, but we, we didn't, but that was on the tape. And you've also cut Steppenwolf for me. Right. From the and master those tapes, tapes, original master, master tapes, tapes, James gang, James master gang. tapes, Leonard Skinner, master tapes. Exactly. But, um, so uh, Graham Nash, who's the nicest guy in the world. I've worked with Graham. He's got a book, which is the book is awesome. I mean, it's unbelievable the stories he has, and it's unbelievable how nice a guy it is, and it's unbelievable how good he is. And I didn't realize that, like, our house and uh, teach the children. Yeah. What's uh, – you know, Teacher on Joe. Deja Vu, how many songs he was really responsible for. Oh, I know. On, well, and, and forget that. Go back to the Hollies, you know. There was some great right. stuff there, too. Oh, well, the Hollies, hello. <laughs> yeah, right. That's where they got the, the Hollies, name. The Hollies, they told the story. Yep. So we found the metal part for this album, the original metal part. It was cut, fixed pitch. We found the metal part. So we're like, wow, that is a huge, great story. QRP on Virgin Vinyl does a flat profile, flat edge, 200 gram from the original part of this record that's going for $500. Now we can do a Virgin Vinyl of a, a the scratch originals going for 500. We can do it on Virgin Vinyl. That's a huge story. But I'm like, well, you know what? We have the master tape. So what do we do? Have a really cool story how we have the original part and we're making a, that's a $500 record. We're, we're going to make it on virgin vinyl or we cut it from the, the master. Well, what do we do? we got a great story. Well, we got to do what sounds best, right? We got to do it. So, all right, okay, we could do both. We do the, the copy of, an original part with the new cut. That's a cool story too. So you cut the original. I don't think we, I was even aware of that. Yeah, I don't know if I even told you this. I don't think you did. So you were doing a shootout against the original and you didn't and even I know. And I didn't it. know it. <laughs> so we get the new cut and we play it and we're like, I don't even have to pull out the original. Because <laughs> uh, you're smoked, the dog. <laughs> do out of it so we're like okay well we got a real cool story <laughs> but who cares about a cool you know, story that tape you gotta sounds, do that tape sounds like it could have sounds been. best right yeah that tape so sounds like it could, huh that tape sounds like it could have been recorded day before yesterday i mean that so is such an amazing nash, tape so graham nash is playing at the steeple theater we called Jane, who runs the Stiefel. She said, listen, we know they're in town. They probably don't have nothing to do. I mean, we're in Salina. Please yeah. let's invite Graham to the studio. So she said, well, uh, his musicians and everybody wants to. We're not sure Graham's going to want to come, but uh, they want to come. Okay. So we go pick him up in my Sprinter van. Yeah. And we have these chairs you could put in the sprinter and pull them out and put them in. And, you know, we use it to, 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 to haul records, but right. we also got uh, those like captain chairs. Yeah. So they put the six captain's chairs in there and we go pick up and Graham gets in and we're like, Oh, you know, I'm so excited. And in the back of my mind, I, I just had found out about the stories of how he called himself the Hollies because buddy Holly, was his favorite musician, and he was, they were going to call it the Hollies or something else. I forgot the other name. 
But right before he took the stage, they had these two names they were going to call each other. I think it's the story. And when Graham got to the stage, he goes, we're the Hollies, you know. So I knew I had this test pressing, both uh -huh. on the new one and the old one. So he came and he sat there. And, oh, and this, this album cover, since it's so rare, we have it on the wall. And when Graham walked in, he started pointing at it. Oh, I wow. go, yeah, I know the story. So I will say, well, we're going to uh, let you listen to it. So he sat there with his eyes closed, and we, we did the both, and he was blown away. And he told me the story, and he also let us uh, use – he wrote the liner because the original didn't have a uh, gatefold. Oh, cool. And I'll read the liner that he wrote. Buddy Holly was one of us. He didn't shake his backside, and he wore glasses, for goodness sakes. <laughs> I love it. Right. Which, you know, even though he looked like a nerd is what he's saying. Right. But he wasn't hot like Elvis. The son of God was so good, he didn't have to be, you know. So he didn't shake his backside, and he wore glasses, for goodness sakes. But his simple yet profound music could be enjoyed and played by everyone. If a, uh, if a musician could play three chords, they could play most of Buddy Holly's song. He only recorded for 15 months. Ah. And this wonderful music is just 15 months. In 15 months, is just astonishing. Yeah. yeah. We took his name for our band, the Hollies. We loved him. Long may he reign. Right. Graham Nash. So I'm like, Graham, can you um you you let you know you write something and he wrote that and it's I mean it's like it's it's well you know the, the Beatles covered Buddy Holly, the 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 Stones covered Buddy Holly. I mean I there's there's people coming up today who don't know who Buddy Holly was, they don't know his Im importance to the record industry, the music industry. It's it's, it's incredible. But uh so I, I think that's a pretty cool story. It you know, is. It's got Graham Nash in it, the, him telling the story about how he, he named it the Hollies, how he loved it. We had the original part. We had your part. We got the master tapes that are supposed to be burned. You smoked the the, 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 the dog shit out of the other one. <laughs> so there, there was no question. But, God, it was like, man, I had a cool story. But, yeah. hey, listen, I could just save people the time. The It wasn't as good. As cool as it would have been to have, the coolest story that I was able to find, the part, and that you could still make records from the original part, it was cut at a fixed groove. Uh -huh. um, so, all right. Also, do you want to tell the story of, you know, I'm going with Hoffman and the Buddy Holly? You mean about first meeting him and everything? Or? No, 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 no. Like Hoffman found the Buddy Holly tapes. Oh, right, 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 right. So you want me to tell that story? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if yeah, yeah, I'm fine. So yeah, well, Steve and I had just started working together, and uh, he was he was uh, had come up from the mail room into doing compilation records, and there were two guys who worked over at M at uh, MCA in the uh, tape vault, the one that burned, and um, but way before that. And they found a box of tapes and they called Hoffman and they said, hey, we want you to come down here and look at these. Um, we were actually thinking about throwing them away because they're completely unlabeled. Yes. Whoa, whoa. Maybe, I didn't hear maybe that. you want to check these things out. So Steve, whoa. Steve went down. And I knew that was a story. But I didn't know it was this good. Oh, yeah. So he went and he picked up the tapes and I believe he took them over to MCA um, probably to uh, Tom Baker, who did most of the tape copy work, and put them up, and sure enough, it, it was it was the, the Buddy Holly tapes that had been missing for forever, and they were com they were they were complete they were in unmarked brown boxes. But I think some of it was unreleased, and y'all released an album. Uh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. They won a Grammy for it, I think. The, the undiscovered Buddy Holly. Yeah, I don't know if that's the title, but it's something that's like what it that. Means. Like something, yeah. The unknown he, Buddy Holly, something like that. Yeah. Man, I'm so glad I pulled out that Buddy Holly because yeah. I mean, we, I, I wasn't even that had a lot of story to it, and I just uh, James, my graphic designer, handed it to me, 
And I thought, well, I'll put it in because, again, we're not going to talk about 90%. That's probably, in, that's probably in the top 10 albums I've cut, you know, in my book, you know. Well, that that was the other thing is of when time. I do this th these things with you and Bernie or, or anybody, I always want y'all like to talk about the biggies in your mind for whatever reason, whether it was a Grammy winner or – Sure. Uh, or just something that meant something to you at the time, maybe the first record you cut or. Um, so I, I'm so glad I pulled that out because it had way more of a backstory. I, I just right. pulled it out uh, again. I, I, there's no way we can go through all the records. I'm glad you, you remembered about the, the monk being your the first one. One of the reasons that I became a mastering engineer, in addition to, you know, seeing artists and sound and, and, and discovering mastering on that level, was Doug Sachs directed this, the, the, the first Lincoln Mayorga and Distinguished Colleagues directed disc. That really, really, really solidified it for me in terms of wanting to become a mastering engineer and someday do a direct -to disc recording. That's, oh, you know. Oh, that's, that's strong. So that's that was, strong. An, that was an epitome for me, you know. That was the wrecking crew basically on. It was. It was. I'll tell you a funny story there too, real quickly. You can find it online if you go look for it. If, if you Google Lincoln My Organ and Distinguished Colleagues Volume 1, some guy wrote this scathing review of that record where he says, these guys don't sound like they know what they're doing. They don't sound like they've ever played together before. And I tried to go in and, and put a comment and it wouldn't allow me. I was going to say, you are joking, right? These guys played together every day of the week. Not only that, but six months, not even six months, three months before, they recorded classical gas with Mason Williams. All all those same guys, all the, that entire group, the specific players in that were the, were the backup band on. on uh, well, if he ever watched the record. Classical gas. Yeah, if he ever watched the the, the, the documentary. Uh, well, you know, I talked to Lincoln about he, – he even was on Zappa albums. I know. Oh, he's amazing. I've he was on Doug Kershaw, the, the Crazy Cajun record. Yep, yep. That was Master and he, and Artisan. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, to go from classical music – oh, The Rose, he wrote The Rose. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, Amanda McBroom wrote The Rose, but maybe he helped her – do it yeah amanda mcbroom wrote the rose but she did they, a think, disc with him right yeah. right so yeah. i mean from being able to do all the classical all the jazz the rose work with zappa <laughs> and doug kershaw i mean it, it's it's pretty amazing uh um, hey, i worked on two zappa albums is that right yeah overnight sensation and apostrophe oh apostrophe <laughs> I'm not like a, a Zappa freak. Like, I mean, a lot I'm of not like, either. But Apostrophe is one of my favorite albums. It's a great record. Oh, uh, I mean, it's, I love Apostrophe. I like Overnight Sensation too. I mean, I, you know, I, you know if I played it more, I might like it. I know it's a classic, but I love Apostrophe. Love it. All right. So we're going to move along. All right. The Beach Boy. My favorite Beach Boys album. All right. My favorite is Surfer Girl. Okay. Sonically, in my room, just blows me away. And I know this is considered like the album of all albums. And I, I, I'd sound like a fool if I didn't. You know, I mean, but Surfer Girl, sonically, musically is. So I call Kevin one day. I, hey, Kevin. Uh, they uh, EMI called me. This is before uni bought EMI. Hey, uh, EMI wants me to do the Beach Boys, pretty much the whole catalog. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> no, I was probably pretty excited. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, so we're like, okay, well, so, oh, oh, here's a good story. Here's a great story. Okay. So they, the Beach Boys played in Salina after I got the rights. Right. Oh, I know so the story, but go ahead. This is yeah, good. Uh, Brian Johnson. Bruce. Bruce. Yeah. Bruce. Bruce. Johnson. Yeah. See how much of a Beach Boy. I mean, I really, I, I okay, just for the record, Analog Productions and Chad Cass, and we normally reissue things that are my favorite records. I have to love it. 
I only reissue my favorite stuff. And right. I'm a little bit younger than you. And Beach Boys, I mean, I've heard it on the radio. I, everybody knows the song. I understand. It, I understand. It was an opportunity. That, and the other thing is, is, hey, I got customers that want this stuff and they love it. And I like it, but I've heard it a lot. I had the opportunity. They also uh, brought Nora Jones to me at the same time, which we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. This is before Uni bought EMI. So I'm like, they go, hey, man, we really need to put the Beach Boys and Nora Jones out. And we know we can't do it as good as you or as quick as you. So if you want to do this, you know, because they knew us, me from doing the 50 Blue Notes. So I'm like, OK. So we got the license to do it. And uh, and so, well, we got to do it right, right? Well. The Beach Boys are playing in Salinas, so I, I get to meet them. And uh, I get to meet Bruce and Mike Love. And they're not that, you know, I thought they'd be like, hey, man, I'm fixing to do your whole catalog. 14 different Beach Boys albums. And they're like, yeah, okay, punk. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we... We got things to do. That's so nice. So, so nice, son. Glad to meet you. Now, now move along. <laughs> I mean, kind of like that in, in, yeah. a nice, in a nice way. Now, Bruce, though, he was, listen, man, you got to do the monos. You got to do the monos. And well, I'm you like. You weren't planning to do it all, right? I, I really weren't. So yeah. I got to give him. I mean, I'm glad I met them and I'm glad he got in my face. I mean, he's like, dude, you got to do the monos because the monos is what Brian uh, signed off on. on. You yeah. got to do the monos. So I'm like, OK, I wasn't sold at the time, but I listened to him. So there's this there's there's a hallway me and him are walking in. And they're walking towards the backstage, and, and this hallway separates. Uh -huh. Going to the backstage or going to the audience. On stage, yeah. So, of course, we're going to separate. You know what I mean? We're walking down this hallway together, and he goes, you got to do the monos. And I'm listening. And he goes, the guy's not listening to me, man. He's not listening. And as he's walking into the other room, you can hear him like about 20 steps going, the guy's not listening to me. He's not listening. <laughs> he kept saying, you got to do the models. You got to do the models. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm not, but I'm not saying I am. Yeah. And he's going, as he walks into that, like, he goes into the other room. The guy's not listening to me, man. He's not listening. The guy's not listening. And I can hear him like 20 steps. Like, he's not listening to me. The guy's not listening. And it's just so funny because I'll never forget that. And then afterwards, we decide to do the monos, and I, hey, I'm going to give him credit, man. Thank thank you. You're listening. Thank you. You're the one that hit me, and uh, and I did it. So I call him afterwards. I got his number, which I don't think was that easy, but I call him, and I think I have an email on him, and I'm like, dude, I did it. I did what you asked me, and it was like, yeah, big deal. All right. You know, so, but I did it. And well, uh, I think the way you told the story originally is you said, you said, so can I get your endorsement now? And he goes, no, because you're doing the stereos too, or something like that. Well, I mean, it could be. It's been a while. <laughs> that was the way but you I, told yeah, me. No, I wanted him to, uh, I don't know what I was wanting. I, I was wanting him to be happy. Yeah. Or, or well, like, sure. I mean, that's, yeah, all, I mean, that's the only reason you did with, it, really. Yeah. Like, what did I want? I, or what did I expect? I expected them to be excited because mm -hmm. it was a lot of money. And, and doing them both cut into the sales of each other. I mean, I had to do two, two different jackets. We did the tip on. Oh, I, I know. mean, it, it cost a lot. And I'm telling you, they didn't fly out. I mean, right. Uh, right. now after this video and now that <laughs> the finalists, I'm sure. Right. 
they're going to be going for hundreds now. Okay. Can I tell my Bruce Johnston story? Please. When I was at Artisan, um, uh, we did the uh, mastering on uh, Sunflower. Well, actually, before I was at Artisan, they did the mastering on Sunflower and Surf's Up. And so we were going to master the Holland album. And uh, Bruce Johnston came in one night with one of the other Beach Boys. I don't remember which one. Um, and hung out for the mastering session on that. And it was with John Golden. And John went to get a cup of coffee, which was around the corner and down the hall. And he's in the coffee room pouring a cup of coffee. And he hears, pow, come out of the mastering room. And he goes running in there. And he's like, what was that? What happened? And the two Beach Boys are like. And he said, Bruce Johnson had this really guilty look on his face. And he looks over. And there, there are you know, electronics cards plugged into the disc cutting rack. One of them's hanging out about, you know, four inches. And he goes, one of you guys pulled this card out? And they're like, no, we didn't, we didn't do it. So he had to turn it off, plug the card back in, turn it back on again. And he, I think he made a quick test cut with maybe a 1K tone and it seemed to be okay. And so they cut. So we're cutting refs on this record. And they're going to the, the the new producer, you know, Steve Desper had quit and Steve Moffat had taken over as the, the engineer, sort of producer, engineer on the record records. And um, so about, I don't know, two or three days go by and Steve Moffat calls Bob McLeod and he said, hey, there's something really wrong here. There's this bass distortion on the left channel throughout the refs. So, you know, Bob threads up the tape, puts a lacquer on the other lathe, makes a test cut of it. It sounds fine. He goes, I don't know what you guys are talking about. It sounds fine. Now, they never offered to bring the ref back in and play it. You know, They basically pulled the project out of there, and it went to uh, Location Recording Service. Steve Guy got that record at Location. So about a week after that, I'm cutting a record that I really like, a 7-inch 45, and I thought, you know what? I'll cut one on the other lathe and play it and take it, you know, take it home so they can play it, right? And so I took the ref home and I put it on my turntable. And there's this bass distortion on the left channel. Bruce Johnston blew out one channel of the cutter head. And we'd been cutting for it with it for probably a week. And we had no knowledge of it. And we lost the record because of him. Man, I'll tell you what. Don't bring any Coke, Coca-Cola. You know, Coke, I'm going to make sure I get that right. But, you know, in a, in a recording studio or a mastering, man, you, you you know, you spill that on a mixing board or something. It's I, mean, you, I mean, what about the song Spill the Wine, <laughs> the Eric Burden song? I mean, um, there's another story about Eric Burden. There's two interesting stories. Uh, I forget the other one, but the first one was, you know, they spilled the wine on the mixing board and they wrote a song about Is it. Is that really where that came from? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you didn't know the story? Yeah. No. Uh, spill the wine, take that girl. Right. They were in a, um, a studio and uh, somebody probably crystal, spilled. Probably Crystal Sound in Hollywood. That's where they did most of their stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but they spilled the wine on the mixing board, screwed it up, and they, they wrote the song. I think wow. hopefully with all the money they made, they should have went, gave it. Uh, so, yeah, so we did. 10 mono Beach Boys and 14 stereo Beach Boys, but the 10 mono had the, the mono and the stereo. So uh -huh. 10 mono and stereo. And then the other four that we did were only stereo records, right? So that was a big deal. That was a lot of work. Um, we're real proud of it. I did get to learn about the Beach Boys and, you know, you had a lot, like, to identify the different masters and to uh, talk to Mark Lynette. There was, a, there was a lot of work done. All right, so we covered the Beach Boys. I think that was monumental in something you did for us and that you actually, from California, grew up with it. True. Pet sounds, I mean, okay, I mean. That, that was a high uh, point. Yeah, okay. That's, that's another one in my top ten. So the one thing about you, Kevin, and I'll tell the world, 
Uh -oh. Kevin, you're listening to such good stuff so much so often that I'm expecting a Kevin to call me on every record we send him <laughs> and go, wow, that sounds great. And I rarely hear from Kevin. Now, I did hear him talk about Domingos, the, uh, yes, yes. the thing you just cut, the blues. Blues the roots. and roots. And, you know, we kind of both agree with Tom Dowd. A lot of his recordings are. are well, I, I, I wouldn't say it that way. A lot of his pop recordings are pretty iffy. And we're talking about Cream and Derek and the Dominoes and some of that kind of stuff. But his his jazz, most of his jazz recordings, I think, were excellent. And the Ray Charles stuff that he did was great. Well, I think he was a great producer. Is probably what he should get more credit for than being yeah. a great engineer. But, but he did some nice jazz. But he, yeah. But that that blues and roots, right? Yeah. Yeah. A so plus. Kevin doesn't call me that often. I, I would expect him to call me more often. But I mean, you're listening to master tapes. You listen to the best of the best. And, you know, hey, so the one thing you did call me on, and I, I, oh, I thought this sounded good, is one of our own recordings. Love that record. That we, we did in the, in, in the Blue Heaven Studios. And uh, I'll never forget on the Nancy Bryan. That's still and, my I favorite mean, thing to come. That's my favorite thing to come out of Blue, Blue Heaven. It really is. Really? Yeah. Well, it was David Baker. The famous jazz engineer. It was all live to two track, thirty inch half, half inch tape, thirty inch per second. But it was good songs, good sound, good production. It, it, you know, it really sounded. It was a great record. Right. I, I thought it was. I mean, it's it's a knockout. And uh, I agree. But I mean, I, we sent you other knockouts that we didn't hear. But but it's hard <laughs> to top this recording. I mean, it's so natural. It's in a church. It's so pure. It's so good. And and uh, it, it was one out of the blue that Kevin's like, hey, man, this sounds awesome. So when Kevin calls me and says, hey, this sounds awesome, like he did with the Mingus Blues and Roots, I'm like, it must be awesome. <laughs> All right. Here's another one that, that Kevin liked. And uh, Tony Joe White, he's from North Louisiana. He just died. He wrote Rainy Night in Georgia and uh, Poke Salad Annie, which you just did. Uh, the, the Poke Salad, his first album, Poke Salad Annie. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one, sonically, musically, is just a knockout. I mean, it's just a knockout. He does uh, Backdoor Preacher Man and, uh, and uh, the. Uh, He's very real. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's he, a good he, way to put it. He's I, the real deal. Did someone make a fool out of you? I love him and like JJ Kale. They're the original songwriters that you know they do the song, uh, sparse, you know, and he's got such a good voice. Uh, I think a lot of people think he's black. I think Tina Turner thought he was black when uh -huh. she met him. She was like, Whoa, <laughs> you know, you, you can't be Tony Joe White. Right, right. He and he told me a story. He he, when she had those big hit, they had the same manager, I think. And so he did undercover. She did undercover agent of the blues, and uh, 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 she did undercover agent of the blues, and uh, another song. I forget two of his songs, that or awesome songs and um he said that they were doing the song and he was playing the guitar he was he was on the session and uh she not uh one of the mics fell over or something she grabbed the mic off of the drum kit and finished the song and he's just sitting there playing his eyes got this big and <laughs> she just grabbed it and finished the song and I wow. think that was the take they used. Wow. Uh, Steamy Windows. Steamy oh. Windows and Undercover Agent of the Blues. There were two okay. huge hits. And okay. he wrote them. And he played on at least one of them. Uh -huh. And in the middle of the song, something happened to the mic. And she just grabbed the drum mic and finished it. And I think that's the one they used. And he's just sitting there going, whoa, lady. You know, and, and um, 
Steamy Winders, an undercover agent of the Blues. Tony Joe White, he's my absolute favorite of all. So, cool. talking about Tony Joe White, uh, who's a Louisiana Blues and Roots, Creedence Clearwater. One of my favorite bands. Right. And their their whole thing was trying to do Louisiana music. And they were trying to be bio boys. Yep. Bayou Country, uh, Proud Mary, you know, Green River. Uh, yeah, I've uh, gotten to my favorite, Willie and the Poor Boys. Willie and the Poor Boys. Down, yeah, down yeah. on the corner, Fortunate Son. Yeah, bo yeah, Born on the Bayou, Proud Mary, you know, it's it's really what they're doing. Cotton Fields, which is a lead belly song. Susie Q, which is Dale Hawkins from North right. Louisiana. Right. Uh, Cotton Fields, which is uh, and Midnight Special. Both of those are lead belly songs. Mm -hmm. Bad Moon Rising, Green River. I mean, it's all about. You know, the, the coolest thing for me that came out of working on that whole project, I think, was um, that I got to meet. Uh, the recording engineer um, got a mental Russ Gary. Russ Gary, yeah, brain fart there for a second. Yeah, Russ. Russ is absolutely amazing. One of the humblest guys I've ever met, uh, and he told me the whole story of how he wound up becoming the chief engineer at Wally Hyder Recording up in in San Francisco. He was an LA guy. Um, he lived in Simi Valley. Still lives in Simi Valley, as far as I know. No, no, no he, he actually, I know he li he moved to the Ozarks. Oh, recently? Not that long ago, yeah. Uh, but okay. he didn't want to do any. He recorded it. He sent me a CD of something he did a long time ago or uh -huh. something. But he don't want. I'm like, dude, do you want to do re re He goes, no, no. But he actually, the entire time he worked at Hyder's in San Francisco, he commuted back and forth. He he would spend like, you know, five days, you know, and go home Friday night and come back Sunday night, you know, and, and uh Jeez, I mean, I can't even believe it. And he well, stayed married to the same woman for through all of it, you know. You know, I remember you, uh, y'all sent me a picture of the one of the tape copy, the original tape, the box, uh -huh. and one of the engineers wrote on there, "This could be a potential hot new group." Right. Hello, right. you know. Right. So I used that in the booklet. That was the first so, engineer. What, what was his name? The guy before Russ took over. Um. I, I can't remember. Yeah, it's right there, and I can't say it. But anyway, so you did all the credence. That was Sounds great. Awesome. Awesome. Sold a shitload. Beautiful booklet. The box is going for crazy money. Right. But we did the whole credence Clearwater box. That was awesome. That had to be, it sounds great. Then you did ah. like six Nat King Coles. Right. And we got. We that got the original three, three track tracks. tapes. Yep. Right. And some of them had never even un been unwound. Right. Since. So this one in particular is unbelievable. It's got Stardust, When I Fall in Love. Right. Um, love is the thing. Yep. This one is one of the killers. They're all killer. Some of the love best Nat. sounding stuff ever. Love Nat. Just one of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was quite a project. Where did everyone go? <laughs> All 45. Well, you know, they called the tower the house that Nat built. Yep, yep. Sometimes I think they, they would say Beatles or Sinatra, but. Yeah, they Nat. did. No, well, I mean, but it's Nat. I mean, it's yeah. Nat. Uh, the very thought of you, but beautiful. Right. I mean, um, this one is killer. Um, the the reason the Nat King Cole is so awesome is that when they mixed it from the three track, they put too much reverb on the originals. We thought, and it uh, it interfered in how I mean, it interfered in how. Hear people being able to hear just how pure his voice is. Oh yeah, we all did it. You you moved his voice Dialed a little back a little. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. This this one is one of the best instrumentals ever. Yep. Uh, oh, what a great piano night. player! I mean, you know the the Nat King Cole trio was amazing. You know, before he ever started singing. 
Yep. After Midnight. Killer. And St. Louis Blues. Killer. And the biggie is the 38 songs on the Nat King Cole story, which we did just like the original with the, the leatherette dial for all the vegans out there that want to return this. They, they, that's, people that's are a- calling us, is this real leather? It's, it's leatherette. It's a leatherette dial uh, and with a, with a uh, canvas. Uh, yep. A canvas box. And uh, that was... What he did then was he went back in the studio in 61 and re-recorded all the hits of the 40s with the same arrangements, but to three-track stereo. Right. So y'all did that. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what blew Steve and I away when we were listening to all that stuff is they would leave things like studio chatter on the beginnings of some of the. Yeah, tracks. I love that. And. And everything was always take one, <laughs> you know, I mean, no kidding. if if there was a mistake, it was the orchestra. It wasn't Nat. Nat, he had perfect pitch and he just he he just sang his ass off on every single track. Uh, and uh, and and here, here's the other amazing thing to me. I think of all of the songs, the only one that was a vocal overdub, I think, was uh, Lazy, Hazy, Crazy Days of Summer. Or I, I got it slightly off, but something like that. Well, yeah, yeah. Because you could listen to the individual tracks, right, and hear the bleed. So if you soloed Nat's voice, you're hearing the orchestra. It's just down and level compared to the sound of his voice. That's the only track where you solo the vocal and it's dead clean. You know. So he well, sang every one of those songs live with the orchestra. I mean, that just blows my mind. We're getting to run out the jackets. I think we're getting one more pressing that. By the time this video comes out, like it's on the press. So we're getting one more chance. Whoever don't buy it, do not call me and cry. <laughs> I, I have no sympathy anymore. Right. I'm sorry. I mean, I love my customers. Uh, you know, they see it going for two, three hundred dollars on Discogs. Hey, Chad. That's yeah, what, me? 15 years ago, right? No, I know, but we, we, we're going to get one more. No, but what I'm saying is if they haven't bought it in 15 years, no, no, they got no, nothing to bitch I said, about. I said, Oh, we only had it for 15 years. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, so, all right. So we went through the Credence, the Monk, the Buddy Holly, the Night King Cole. All right. So you did a Bill Evans box with all 11 Bill Evans records. Uh, this is going for silly, silly money and worth every penny of it. It's all the Bill Evans Riverside recordings. We pressed that at RTI, uh, no, no, Palace and, a, and QRP. Uh, had that available forever, and you know, everybody's calling us. We're trying to repress it, but we have to negotiate. Okay, so Bill Evans, the Riverside, the River, it's 11 albums, 22 sides. Awesome. You did the whole Nora Jones. That was fun. Yeah, we still have a few of these left. Uh, I was only familiar with her first two albums. I hadn't heard the other ones. Right. Well, I, I like the the first ones. They're all good. I but like them all. Can, I really do. I like them all. I don't even have a favorite, really, I don't think. This is a great box. We have a few left. We Pick have them a up few while you can get the, them, people. Right. We have a few left of these. I don't want to hear it. I'm sorry. I don't want to hear it. Yeah. They're here. They're now. Right. This is uh, what's the date today? Uh, June, June, June 19th. It's Juneteenth. Ju- Juneteenth. Wow. Um, historical day. Yep. And uh, a legal holiday now. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. I heard that. Uh, does that mean that a legal holiday? Will the post office be off? I yeah, but I don't know if it has gone into effect yet. Well, you know does what's that, funny? Does that mean I get paid time and a half or double time for the? No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. But <laughs> well, the postal came today, ah, so maybe okay. next year. Yeah. Right, so then uh, you can see the blue note. You did fifty blue notes, forty-five like cannibal something else, blue train, and then we did a hundred 
fantasy reissues. Right. Way out west, walls for Debbie. Basically on that, uh, it used to be fantasy owned. And that's why we call it fantasy. So they own contemporary Sonny Rollins and Art Pepper. They own Riverside contemporary Pablo. Right. Uh, and, uh, and fantasy. And we picked what we thought were the fam- the best hundred records out of the thousands of records that those labels owned, you know, way okay. out West, Chet Baker, Chet. There's another top 10 of Kevin Gray's top 10 that he's ever worked on in that series. And that's uh, on the impulse stuff. Um, the blues and the abstract truth. Oh, we're going, we're going to get to that. Cause the impulse, oh. but they're not part of this. Well, it was part of the jazz. Was that no, part no. Of the- mm-hmm. Oh, because fantasy, yeah, I, get, I get it mixed up. They all run together. <laughs> we're we're going to get there. So we talked about the Bill Evans box, the Monk box, yep, the Nora yep. Jones box. Yep. We talked about the 50 Blue Notes, 100 Fantasy, Fantasy on Contemporary, Riverside, okay. Prestige, right? Uh, Pablo, and Fantasy. So we picked out of those labels like the Charlie Brown Christmas album, yeah, yeah, yeah. the it's Chet Baker deep. Chet, the Way Out West, the meets the rhythm section, uh, the best prestige. We did a hundred. All right. So that's that. Now we can talk about, we did 25 impulse. Oh, okay. We did 25, which you're talking about. So that was not part of the a jazz series. Uh, uh-uh. no, it was the next one of the next. Oh, okay. sets. See, it so all far, right. Sorry, so it runs together did, for me. So far we did 50 blue notes. Okay. A hundred fantasy. Right. 50 prestige for 33, 25 impulse. And then now I didn't do this with you, but I did 25 verve. Um, 25 verve. So I've done 25 verve, 50 blue note, 25 impulse, 100 fantasy. Um, and, and 25 verve for uh, these jazz series we're doing. And now we're doing the acoustic sound series. Now, uh, Ryan Smith, no, no, excuse me, not Ryan Smith. George Marino, before he died, did the 25 verb. Now, you okay. did the 25 impulse. And um, a friend of ours um, who I like and respect very much, I know the same for you, uh, you know, there was a big to do of, 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 of some of the master tapes that uni had being burned and the, the Gil Evans out of the cool isn't one of them. And we proved it. The, the James gang isn't one of them. We proved it. The Steppenwolf, the Leonard Skinner, the Buddy Holly. So same with, you know, Michael doesn't think we had the original master on, the Gil Evans, which we did, you know, you, you, the only way you could say, you know, for a fact is if you were there. Right. Right. And so uh, the new 33 is awesome, but you did a great job. You did Love Supreme, which in that that impulse series, you, these are my favorites. You did. Well, they, they're all good. They're all, you did the Louis and Ella. No, no, that, that's impulse. I'm getting mixed up. That's, that's you did the Love yeah. Supreme. 45, the John Lee Hooker serves you right to suffer. Right. The Gil Evans out of the cool and the uh, the Oliver Nelson blues in the abstract truth. That's you're saying one of your favorite records. It is. It's, um, you know, people say, well, what's your favorite jazz album? You know, that's that's the one that comes to mind, even though, you know, kind of blue is pretty iconic, pretty hard to beat. But, um, you know, and, and it's probably my favorite jazz album but a close 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 second would be oliver nelson blues in the abstract too that record just does it for me right right well hey man there's so many famous records you cut so many that i'm not even i mean you did dusty in memphis you've done so many records that that uh for us probably more than anybody uh, oh you've also you know we need to talk about you come to the studio and all the directed discs, like the yeah, like thir- thirty by my count, I think. 
probably. And then you did uh, pretty much all the APO, you know, our, our blues label. Right. Uh, uh, which was all done in the church. Whether Jimmy it's D. Morning, Knox, Jimmy D. Lane. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, Calvin, you've, you've done more for us than anybody. And I, I and I owe you uh, again for uh, now we have Matt working for us. So Matt Luthens uh, learned from Kevin. He's in Salina now running off our reel to reel tapes. And right. He's good guy. And, uh, good. Oh, and, nicest. And a good engineer. Yeah. Nicest guy. Plus he can record. Right. So we're, we're going to utilize him. Um, nicest guy. Learn from you. Appreciate you helping him when he gets stumped. Uh, no, no problem. Working on it. I mean, he's getting to work on Doug Saxes. It's a historic, uh, you know, board and, 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 and system. Took us forever, forever to, uh, to work on that and get it running. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tom Pisano, Chris Muth, they've both been a big help. Right. So, um, you know, it just continues, man. And, I mean, did you ever, and if you tell me you did, I'm going to call you a liar in front of the public, think that this would happen, what's happening now with vinyl? No. No, as a matter of fact, I've told people that when, when Steve Hoffman comes to me in 1992 and says we're jumping back into vinyl, my response was, what are you, crazy? I mean, it just seemed like the phonograph record was dead. It's not that I didn't love the sound and wasn't excited about doing it. I just couldn't imagine that there was room for it again after the CD had you know, been around for almost a decade at that point. Well, yeah, but I mean, so it, it impressed you and surprised you right. from then until two years ago, right? That it was it was always like this, itching up, the momentum. Oh, going I know. Up. But now well, it's like this. I mean, <laughs> well, I know, you know, like, like, like we said, you know, in, in terms of my involvement, there was the M MCA heavy vinyl, which was the first time that that a major label jumped back in. And then in 2005, you know, Tom Berry with Warner jumped back in with all those great titles. That was some great stuff, too. I, well, like I, I kind of I helped Tom. I don't know how much credit, that, but I helped pick those. OK. Um, well, great stuff. Awesome stuff. And, you know, and then it's been exponential since then, I would say, since 2005. It's just been every year. I mean, we, we don't, QRP, done, it's been eight months since we take a new order. I know. I mean, and, and we I got to tell you, that's what's scaring me the most right now is that most of the small guys and new guys can't get their records pressed. So how does that bode for the record industry in the long run? I don't know. It worries me. I don't me. know, but I mean... You know, listen, I can't kick the Beatles off the press. I'm sorry. Oh, I understand. And I'm not and saying you should. And Hendrix, they joined me before I made one record. The Hendrix uh, Experience Center said, we're with you. We're going to bring you all our work. Right. Before I made a record. So, man, I mean, I got loyalty. Beatles and Hendrix and, the, and the, my own stuff, you know. And then Uni oh, brings I, I totally top, understand. They bring just... your top artists to us, like the artists that – and I, I, you know, I don't know how RTI does it. Uh, they make more records than us, but they, they're still taking new orders. And I'm like, I don't think so. I don't think. Oh, now. really? Well, up they're until telling, recently, they're they're, telling well, my they customers. tell people if they're willing to wait a year, you know. Well, yeah, they're, send, they're sending my customers away. You know, the guys that I try to send to them, they're sending them away and telling them a year. So, yeah, I don't. I just do not have to tell you. We'll do your plating. No problem. Right. Right. Uh, but yeah, I've uh, lost three projects this year that were all ready to go. I mean, I had them, you know, they were they were from from high res digital. I had them in my computer, had them all ready to cut. And the guy would call me up and say, I can't get the thing pressed for a year. I'm, I'm just going to cancel the project. It's like, OK, well, I mean, <laughs> it's times. a good problem. It's a problem. I have one hundred and fifty nine records on back order, my own label. And so I'm I'm like. Do I pull the Beatles to do my record or do I pull Hendrix to do? I'm I'm taking the back seat to a lot of people. I just can't take that seat. You know, I got to get some of my records out. And sure. And uh, but anyway, Kevin, I appreciate the uh, for 
24 years of knowing you. Appreciate all you've done for our record. Uh, Likewise, I appreciate the stuff that you've allowed me to master. I mean, I, I appreciate that. You know, you've been around uh, for, for us for a long time. I mean, like I said, with this Acoustic Sounds Verb series, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not picking one horse and riding it. You know, I'm going to, I use, I think Bernie's great. I think you're great. I think Ryan's great. Uh, and Matt's coming along. I've, I've been friends with Bernie for, you know, the whole time I've been in the business. And uh, I've only met Ryan once, but I've, I respect him highly. So very yeah. professional. Yeah, you, got very a, you, nice. got a, you got a good team. Very nice, very professional guy. There's a lot of reasons why I think it's good to have a team. You know, if you're too busy or they're too busy or, the, or they don't want to bring the tape here or there or it's the tape's close to you or right. you've already worked on, you know, Kevin's cut all of these records, you know, like when it makes sense, man, it, that's where it's going. And sometimes I'll just flip a coin, but um, there's so much uh, – to come, man. There's so many big things around the corner. Awesome. Uh, and uh, oh, hey, I think we can reveal the the stand up. Let me know when you get the Jethro Tull stand up tape. Okay. Those were both mastered at Artisan. Stand up and and uh, Benefit were both cut at Artisan. Is that right? Bob you don't did have those. The, uh, do you? I sent you the original British. Uh, yeah, I got it yesterday. Okay, you got them. Okay. Make sure you get those back, man. Those I are, will. Those, I promise. Those pink, those pink islands. And hey, if you see any other records floating around back there, uh, okay. No, I'm I'm pretty sure it's all gone back. Right, but uh, anyways, I think we. I mean, listen, you and Michael and Danny, y'all did a good job. You know, I was like, I was like, oh shoot, you know, they're they're interviewing. Kevin no, I think I, I think this one has been different enough. No, yeah. I know. I mean, but after I watched the other one, I was, I'm friends with those. I love those guys. They're doing a great job. Danny's doing a great job, and he's able to get himself. Uh, he's such a fan of this that he, but he's got such a good job. He can't make more in this business than he does with his job. Uh -huh. So he's able to get uh, do something in, within our industry. I, I think it's perfect. He found his niche, and Michael is great, and. You know, I was just a little bit surprised. And, but then after I watched it, which was great, it was like, no, my plan with Kevin was to go through the history of um, his history to document it. I'm going to do it with Bernie and I'm going to do it if, if Bob Ludwig wants to do it. The people I know. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to use since I'm friends with you guys and I know you guys uh, and I've got a pretty decent channel like we're, we're up to almost 7500 subscribers and you know like we we got over almost 30,000 views on the kind of blue we're we're we're, we're coming along that's amazing and uh i'm going to call some people like you and you know maybe James Guthrie some of the people i work with um and do these uh i've talked to Bernie about it and we're going to do different themes and uh and, and this was one of the first ones along that line. And and so, yeah, we, I want to do your history. I like documenting history, telling the truth, getting the story straight, setting the story straight. And right. always right. be there, you know, because something could happen to you, something could happen to me, something could happen to Bernie. And, you know, like his story with Contemporary, how he started with A&M. And right. it's, it's fascinating to me. If it's fascinating to me, I think it's fascinating to my customers and I want to get the story straight. And so now you've done two and they're different and boom, there it is. And and we sell a lot of the tone poet. And, and, uh, and so now you, you, you going to be on some of the ones that I do on the acoustic sounds verb series. And that thing is just, I mean, it's just, um, there are some titles, 18,000 first star. you wow. know what I mean? Like, I mean, when people, it's successful. And uh, we appreciate you doing this. We appreciate what you've done. Thank we look you. forward to uh, the stuff like the Jethro Tull stand up. 
Looking big forward. title. Uh, we ain't for, we 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 gonna throw you some bones over there, some good bones. All right. And uh, look forward to it. And uh, hey, look forward to getting uh, the test pressing on the Mingus and all the other stuff. And uh, and thanks for helping Matt and and helping Matt if we got a problem. And uh, we, my we, pleasure. We like staying, you know, we we want to be friends with everybody, and, and we are. And we're not just, do, you know, doing it because we need you or, you know, we, we like being friends. Cause right. Yeah, I, I don't find too much <clears throat> vicious rivalry in this business. Um, I, I find that most people are friendly with the other people. You know, I, you know, I don't consider, you know, Bernie's obviously a competitor, but I don't think of him in those terms or Ryan. Well, hey, you know? Listen, Bernie got a year's worth of shit to cut. And so do you. It's like, right. It, right. You know, right. Yeah. yeah. Bernie ain't going to, Bernie ain't going to lose no sleep or you're not going to, y'all both right. are busy and there's room for both. Hey, we got, we got some years to go, man. I, I appreciate yeah. uh, being on, on, uh, working with you and the others and being part of, I mean, I, dude, I'm just, you know, I'm just really a consumer, just really a fan. You know, that's all. I, I, I think the mastering engineer's job, you're the last ears before the public hear something. Right. To make sure that if it's too bright, you know, you got to tone it down. You got to make it suitable for the la the consumer to, right. to enjoy it, right. but I think I'm I'm like that in the fact that I'm like one more level uh, before you know like before I I think I have an idea what my customers like to hear and what they don't uh -huh. like to hear. Right, and, and I think I know that too from working with you for so long. Right, and I think that basically. Sometimes that sometimes like we're cutting this record right now that's got so much detail and the snare is so bah, bah, but it's too much it's too much information it's too hot it's too lot it's too sometimes it's you know sometimes you got to compromise to like some people sometimes go too far the other way and get it too warm rich and smooth mm -hmm. or do the smiley face too much but sometimes that's needed, man. It, it yeah. So my guys, I always think they want warm, rich, and smooth. Right. Not too warm, rich, and smooth, <laughs> but and they want to listen and and they want to the record to pull them in. They want to stay in the room. If it's too bright and too hard, they right. leave the room. They'll turn it off. Right. You know. So. I, I barely ask you to recut anything. You you already know. You don't even need me to tell you. You know, I send you the original. I send you, I get you the original master. I fight for it. And you can attest. You know who gets you the master and you know who don't. Okay. And you know the few times that I don't that it ain't either ain't one or it's in bad shape. I'll fight to the fucking death to get that son of a right, right, right. And um like this, and so I send you the, the original album. Sometimes it ain't the original you have to beat. Sometimes like with the, the Mingus blues and roots, the original ain't that good. I'm like you know, you know my taste, you know our guys' taste. Um, I feel like it's going to be killer, and nine, more than nine out of ten times it is. I mean, more than nine out of ten. Uh, sometimes, hey, man, uh, you know, or I've heard something. I heard the original, or I heard something that really made me like the album. Man, can you? And we work with it to get it to where I like it. Maybe you agree with me, or maybe you're happy with at the end, or maybe maybe you're not. Uh, oh, I can't. I really can't think of anything that we've fought over. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, like 
Uh, maybe you're, most of the time you're like, yeah, I think if we do that, we can get it better. And But it don't really happen that often. But like I said, you're the last ears before the consumer hears it. I'm like even a one step. All I do is like I tell people, you know, I know what butter is supposed to taste like. <laughs> you know, like I said, I don't have to stick my head up a cow's ass to see where <laughs> butter comes from. I'm the guy that knows what it tastes like it should taste like or what my guys want it to taste like right and so i'm the last years and then we and i obviously i think we between us have done all right with the the way we want it to hear i agree we, we want them to hear it the best that it, we want it to, when i reissue an album i want people to get it and they go i've never this is my favorite record and i've never heard it sound this good before that's that's my goal. Sure. I, no, I want to hear my favorite record better than it's ever sounded before. And so a lot of people say, well, I don't know why Chad doesn't do a lot of the new music. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, it doesn't sound that fashion. good. Huh? It doesn't sound that good. Right, right. Call me old fashioned and I'm a stick in the mud and I'm stuck in the 70s. Guilty. Guilty. <laughs> yeah. Let somebody else do the rap and the new music and yeah, the I stuff I, I do what I like. But there's exceptions to the rule, like Nora Jones, you know. Well, I liked her. I liked her. Some of the, the, the old, I, I liked Nora Jones. Well, yeah, yeah. There's some exceptions. Right. New music that I like. Right. right. Amos Lee, awesome. Counting Crows, although it's not new anymore. It's new to me. Awesome. The first album, you yeah, know, yeah. Nora Jones, there are new artists that I like. Right. There's just not a lot of them. And right. there's not, I haven't heard it. And I can't listen to everything. Right. So I got to stick in my, my, my swing zone. Mm -hmm. What I like, like the blues and a lot of people criticize me for that. That's what I like. I'm sorry. I grew up on it. Uh -huh. You know, I like jazz, but I like bluesy jazz. I mean, you if you look at the titles I pick, it's not going to be too much really hard bop or bebop. I like some of it, but if it's too hard jazz or I love Coltrane, but there's a few Coltrane's it's a little bit much for me. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I don't. I didn't like his free jazz kind of stuff. Right, and and even Blakey's a little bit hard on. Yeah, I like the bluesy jazz, uh -huh. the stuff that has holes, right? The stuff that's accessible, the right. stuff that's melodic. I agree. That's what I'll, there's enough of that. The Sonny Rollins and, and the, you know, the, 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 the Art Pepper and even some of them kind of get, but there's enough of the smooth accessible right. that right. I don't need to do the way out. Let somebody right. else do the way out. Exactly. And, and so if somebody knows me and what I like, it sounds like you're, you know, but you know, Hey, if your client brings you something far out, you're going to cut it, you know, oh, yeah. and you're going to try to make it the best you can. Right. You know, is, are you going to listen to that? Maybe yes, maybe no. But I'm going to do the stuff I like the most because basically my customer calls me and he says, Chad, I want you to recommend some albums. I can't recommend stuff I don't like and I can't recommend them stuff that I'm scared he's not going to like because it's right. too... I got to get them into the accessible classical. I'm not going right. to go with Weeberg or Berg or Schoenberg or this <laughs> contemporary, like, hard. I got to get him into the, you know, uh, the Scheherazade, you know, the Beethoven right. Sixth, right. you know, the Way Out West, the Bill Evans Walls for Debbie. I... If they want to go into that symphonic they, dances, yeah, they need they need smooth, they need accessible. Right. And once they like me, I didn't grow up on classical, but once you brought me into it with some accessible stuff, then I start branching out and learning. Sure. But I, I can't hit people with the hard stuff to begin with. Right. I, a lot of the hard is too hard for me. So you probably like me and and. It starts with the blues, really everything. Uh, and that's what I like. And I mean, if I'm going to spend my money, 
and reissue stuff I've got to be able to recommend. It's going to be what I like. Now, again, Chad doesn't do enough new music. Guilty. I'm sorry. There might be another label that does that for you, like Intervention right. does yeah. uh, some that stuff that I wouldn't do. That stuff. And he tries hard to not be just a do. He's trying hard not to be another Analog Productions or. Right. Yeah. And I, and you know what? My hat's off to him, man, because I want everybody to bring something different. Sure. Him to be kind of known for his thing. Right. And, he, and he's taken up some slack on some stuff that I did. Although Joan Armitray happened to be one of my favorite records. So he does some stuff, but, but I can't do it all. Right. Concord can't do it all. Right. Uh, uh, Uni can't do it all. Mm -hmm. So it takes all of us to do a little bit. Dude, I appreciate you doing this. I hope you think that this was, uh, you talked about stuff that's interesting that you. Oh, yeah. No, I had a good time. Yeah. And hey, dude, I appreciate it. And Kevin, thank you so much. You Can't wait welcome. to hear the Jethro Tull stand up. <laughs> there is an exclusive, uh, you know, in info like a uh, hot tip. Right. The reveal. They call the new words reveal. The, right. And uh, dude, I appreciate you, man. And thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you, you too, Chad. All right, Kevin. All right. Take Thanks. care. Take care.